Good evening, everybody. I'm Dean Pierce. I'm the Director of Planning and Zoning for the Town, and I'd like to uh, start this off by welcoming you to the meeting tonight. We're scheduled to start at 6, so I figured I will reward you for coming on time, and, and we'll start at 6. Um, the purpose of the meeting tonight is to help provide information about the National Register nomination that's being developed for the Shelburne Falls area of town. This is actually the second time there's been a meeting of this type because an initial draft of the nomination was prepared something like eight or nine years ago by three graduate students at the University of Vermont. Um, so some of you might have actually been at an earlier version of this, of this event. Um, I'm hoping that you find tonight's session informative um, and that you use the opportunity to get any questions that you have about the nomination process uh, answered. Um, I will say that this is a, a meeting that has a companion meeting. On February 11th, there will be another session that is being uh, co-sponsored uh, by the town with the Historical Society, and the focus of that event will be a little different from tonight. Tonight is a meeting that is uh, on the schedule for this project as a meeting with landowners. It's specifically focusing on people who own property or live in property within the area that may be subject to the nomination. Um, just wanted to make it, make it clear that this is a meeting specially for property owners. Um, as part of welcoming you, I just wanted to mention there is a short agenda. If you wanted to pick up one of those, please sign in. If you can, provide some contact, contact information so that we can reach out to you if we um, have need to do that. Bathrooms are down the hall. There's a coffee machine in the room next door. Uh, enjoy the cookies and the seltzer. Uh, generously furnished by Dorothea Pinar. Um, the meeting is being recorded tonight by VCAM, so within 24 or 36 hours, it'll be something that you can watch uh, on uh, cable TV or online at vermontcam.com. O-R-G, sorry about that, Eric. I should know that. Um, as part of the welcome, and I wanted to introduce um, or recognize at the very least some folks who are here. This, this is a project that's done under the auspices of the Historic Preservation and Review Commission, which is a body that was created by the Select Board at the tail end of the 80s or early 90s. Um, that group is chaired by Fritz Horton, who's a local architect who's not here. The vice chair is Dorothea Pinar, who's here. Mark Vincent is the one who's helping out by passing out the agendas. Um, other members of the HBDRC may show up. Um, the HBDRC, Historic Preservation Review, Design Review Commission, was created by the Select Board to advise the town on historic preservation matters. So they were created to help the town um, work on projects such as this, which is in essence an effort to understand and identify and document historic resources in a specific part of town. In fact, the original part of town, the oldest part of town. Um, the speaker for tonight uh, is Brian Knight. Brian is based in southern Vermont, Dorset, I believe. Um, although he's no stranger to Shelburne, um, he, about 15 years ago, was hired by the town to work on a, another historical um, historic project um, that we call the Oral History Project, if anybody wants to know more about that. Some of you might have even been interviewed uh, or maybe know people who were interviewed as part of that project. So anyway, um, Brian knows the town quite well. Um, he has also been hired by many other communities around the state to do similar projects for them. Um, he's also written at least a couple of books, two books. He's written, he has written two books um, and is um, doing talks on one of them, which is a history of snowboarding in southern Vermont. So if you have an interest in snowboarding, I'll put the plug in for that. Um, I think at this point, I'm going to turn things over. This is a pretty comprehensive slide presentation that he has, and you will learn a lot, I hope, and we will save time at the end for any questions that people have. So without any further ado, Brian. Thank you. Take away. Uh, and would people like me to adjust the lights? I can do them about half if this isn't suitable the way that it is now. People okay with it? Or? It's fine. No, it's good. Well, thank you for having me uh, up here tonight. Uh, it is good to be back. I did, uh, I 
I did live here, uh, Mac Farm Road, uh, back around 2000. So it used to be my home as well. And uh, I uh, moved down to Manchester in about 2003. So it's always good to come back up here. As uh, Dean said, the goal of this meeting is to discuss the National Register of Historic Places and the actual process that what, what it means to become uh, listed on the National Register. Uh, provide a little bit of a history of Shelburne Falls. Uh, I'll leave the juicy stuff till the 11th. That's, uh, that's when I'll put the good stuff out. Uh, I'll just put, it'll be a teaser. Uh, discuss differences between National Register listing and other local regulations, and uh, answer any questions that you may have about this process. Uh, the National Register is an official federal list composed of districts, sites, buildings, structures, and objects significant in American history, architecture, archaeology, engineer, and culture. Uh, it started in 1966. It's uh, administered by the Department of Interior National Park Service. Uh, when it first started, it really focused on the, the grand buildings. Uh, uh, homes of presidents and uh, robber barons and captains of industry. And over time, it's sort of rippled down and uh, it's really starting to focus on sort of the, uh, I don't want to say lower levels, but not the upper class, not the grand mansions, but it's starting to focus more on the people that really created and formed and uh, formed the backbone of this country. And so uh, it's no longer just the mansions, it's also the mills and uh, uh, work, workers' districts and housing and uh, other items like that. So it's really spread out in terms of the scope of what the National Register uh, consists of. Uh, what does it mean to be listed? Uh, it's mainly honorific. Uh, it's something that honors the property by recognizing its importance to the community, local, or to the state, or even to the nation. Uh, it can, uh, the big sort of uh, myth out there is that once you get put on the National Register, uh, you can't do anything with your building. Uh, that is not true. Uh, you can paint it purple if you want. Uh, you can uh, tear it down if you want. I don't suggest that you do it, but uh, that, there's not a, uh, a limitation on your, uh, excuse me. Sorry about that. It's not a limitation on your private property rights. And so that's a very key factor. I think that's something that a lot of people think, that once you're on the National Register, uh, you're going to be limited in what you can do to your building. That is uh, not true. Uh, it's, it's not true in the sense that the National Register nomination does that. There's plenty of other tools at perhaps a local level that would uh, could affect what you can do to your building. But the federal government cannot uh, tell you what to do with your building. And even though it's run by the National Park Service, it doesn't mean your house becomes a park. Uh, you, uh, you don't have to open it up to the public, and uh, you don't have to have hours of operation or anything of that matter. Uh, you're also not required to restore them and uh, maintain a certain level of preservation or restoration on the house. Uh, it's, uh, you can, even once again, I don't suggest it, but you can let it run into the ground if you want, but uh, there's nothing sort of telling you what you want to have to do. Uh, what it really does, and this comes out of, uh, out of the urban renewal of uh, the uh, Eisenhower and uh, Kennedy administrations. Uh, and during that period, the urban centers of America have, uh, were suffering from what the term of that day was, was urban blight. Because of suburbia, suburban growth, Everyone was moving out of the towns, the cities, and out into the suburbs. And as a result, the downtowns were becoming very uh, uh, torn, uh, run down. And in an effort to revitalize those downtowns in the 50s and 60s, there was these federal programs where they tore down a lot of historic buildings and built civic centers, town centers, uh, and other uh, areas of uh, that we're supposed to bind the community together. Uh, we have the, the town center in Burlington. Uh, I think of downtown Albany when you see the egg when you drive down. That's all part of urban renewal. The government center in Boston. Those are all efforts to, uh, to revitalize downtowns. 
uh, what, or downtown cities. But what really happened is that the government came in and were just able to uh, take properties and tear them down. Uh, there's a lot of legal background to this that I won't bore you with, or I don't even know if I could handle myself. But uh, it really sort of people woke up and said, wait a second, what, what just happened? There used to be this amazing city block of uh, wonderful homes, and now they're gone. And so this led to the creation of the National Register nomination process, because once you do have a building that's listed on the National Register, it protects you from any government action, really. So in Shelburne Falls' case, uh, for whatever reason, if they wanted to turn Falls Road into a four-lane highway or a two-lane highway or expand it, tur put turning lanes in or do anything uh, that had federal money being used, it would trigger a review process. And it would just at least slow down the government in a way and make sure that whatever action is being proposed, it is not going to affect the historic integrity of, of your village, of your house, of, of the entire town. Uh, so what it does is really sort of put a, put a hold on the, on, the, on the demolition or construction process and allows uh, the town or the community to sort of assess you know, what is, what is the long-term impact of this uh, proposed work? Uh, there are, op when you are in the National Register, there are options for, there are, federal funding is available, but that ba is based on the town or the state. Uh, it's not a given. So uh, I'm not going to say that you can get money because you're listed on the National Register, but there could be opportunities down the road um, if you are listed. If you're a commercial entity, in a National Register building, you do get a tax credit for redoing your building. So any commercial property listed in a National Re Register district does uh, have financial incentives. Uh, just to give you an example of what can happen to a, uh, to a downtown, that's Burlington. Uh, I don't know, early 50s maybe. And uh, as a result of urban renewal, uh, they uh, took out what was known as Little Italy. And uh, it was just uh, uh, wood frame houses. Uh, and there was a, a real community there. And, uh, and uh, they were all displaced. And I can't think of the uh, housing project that they went into. But they took everyone that lived in Little Italy and put them in a housing project. Uh, but what you lost is the uh, sort of that bit of identity that was in that part of town. And uh, what you get when you do have people of a common background living together working together, you have that sense of neighborhood that really just sort of disappeared with the move of a, uh, with a bulldozer. Uh, just so to go over what I was just saying, the myth is that you're required to maintain or restore your building, required to open it to the public. It doesn't necessarily guarantee you protection. It's not, it doesn't stop everything. You, it, and uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't mean you can't sell it either. Uh, some would say it actually increases property values if you uh, can say that your building is listed on the National Register. Uh, fact, uh, it does provide recognition. It really is honorific. It's uh, something that gives you some pride in your, in your home or in your village. Uh, there is the limited protection that I was just describing. And uh, as I said before, you can qualify for certain tax credits if you're a commercial entity. So what can be listed? Buildings, individual buildings. Uh, the Tracy House here in Shelburne is a good example. Sites, um, battlefield sites uh, can be listed. Uh, structures, uh, I know down White River Junction, uh, there's a train that's listed on the National Register. Uh, objects, I mean structures, I'm sorry, objects was the train. Structures, uh, bridges. Um, and then districts, like in Shelburne Falls, a collection of buildings. And you can also be nominated at different levels. Uh, national level, Shelburne Farms, it's actually a National Historic Landmark. That's actually taking it to a, another whole level of, in terms of, of recognition. But it, it is a good example of a building or buildings that uh, are not significant to the country. Uh, state, like the Constitution House in uh, Windsor, uh, where the early days of well, Vermont's history can stem from that building. 
and then local, uh, you know, we have the Tracy House. Uh, Tracy, Lee Tracy was uh, uh, significant to the town and probably, you could say, to the region and perhaps even argue to the state. Uh, there, there, there are different ways that you can argue uh, the, different, uh, the different levels of significance. It doesn't really matter in the end. It's, you're listed on the National Register. Uh, but these are just three, three different ways that you, your site or your building or your districts can be uh, identified for the significance. Uh, and there's also four different criteria for listing on the National Register. A is association with events, activities, or developments that were important to the past. And so that, in the case of Shelburne Falls, would be uh, its uh, the, the role of mills in the town and the, the development of a commercial center, uh, the role of agriculture, representative of these historic events that uh, not only are representative to what happened in Vermont, but also nationwide. Uh, they help tell a story of, of the history of this area um, that, you know, once again, it's not, we're not talking about this is where the Declaration of Independence was signed. This is not where George Washington slept. Uh, this is, uh, we're taking it down a little notch in terms of uh, the emphasis of how historic it was, but uh, it does represent these broad themes in history. Uh, associated with the lives of people who are important to the past, uh, Criterion B, so that would be uh, uh, the birthplace or some, of somebody or um, a place where someone lived, uh, like a president or a governor. Uh, C, associated significant, with significant architectural history, landscape history, and engineering achievements. Uh, this really just means that in the case of Shelburne Falls, uh, the houses uh, retain a lot of their original elements. They haven't been uh, altered. Uh, or they haven't been changed too much. And also in the terms of Shelburne Falls, you have the linear pattern of the town that's still, the village that's still intact. Uh, you still, uh, the village layout is still intact. You get a real sense of what it was like in the 18th century and the 19th century when you're there. Uh, and also just not a lot of infill as well. Not a lot of tall buildings or modern buildings that are upsetting the overall uh, cohesiveness and integrity of, of the village. And then D is potential to yield information through archeological investigation about our past. And uh, even though we're not using D in this nomination, there's a good example of archeological evidence or the potential for archeological evidence in Shelburne Falls, uh, just down by the falls themselves. Uh, there, is, there could be a lot of history of what went down in Shelburne Falls underneath the, underneath the ground there. Uh, but in this case, we're not uh, using that. Uh, so just once again, uh, everything I basically said, but uh, associated events, there's a strong association with development of agriculture and industry. Uh, that's fascinating about these early, uh, these, these mill villages is the, uh, uh, the duality of the people who lived there. They, they lived in the mills, but they also had a small farm. Uh, and most of them did. So they, when you see these houses and these collections of houses, not only... Do they tell the story of the mills? Because maybe there was a shop there, or maybe the person who lived there worked in the mill, or maybe the person who lived there owned the mill, but he also had a whole bunch of outbuildings and probably had a small farm as well. Uh, so you have two stories going on that represent these larger stories that are going on in the state and the country. And uh, Sh Shelburne Falls uh, did develop as the manufacturing center for, uh, for this community. And it was uh, the main industry and business center. And with the railroad, uh, the Shelburne Village and, and Burlington were growing as regional centers. So a lot of the work could be done at Shelburne Falls. And then using the railroad, uh, the, the products of these mills could be distributed throughout the, uh, throughout the state. And then C, uh, in more detail, uh, if the buildings uh, have distinctive characteristics of a type, period, or method of construction that re represent the work of a master or possess high artistic values or that represent significant and distinguishable entity whose components may, may lack individ individual distinction. 
Uh, so in Shelburne Falls, you do have these individual houses that are amazing uh, examples of, of uh, architectural design. They retain a lot of their original elements, a lot of their uh, decorative features. Uh, but you also have the relationship of the buildings to each other. Uh, they retain a similar setback, uh, the same massing. Uh, once again, there isn't that much new infill that's upsetting the, the visual integrity of the, uh, of the village. And then you have uh, some great examples of different architectural styles, such as Greek Revival and Queen Anne styles. And uh, in this map is from the 1850s and I don't have it blown up but it really I mean that's pretty much how Shelburne Falls looks today it really has retained that linear effect with the, t the buildings lining the road it's uh, it's remarkably intact in that regard uh, so Dean did mention uh, the original process uh, with the graduate students uh, their original uh, proposal was much larger than what we're proposing this time around. Their proposal went all the way up Falls Road, up this way. And uh, what, why that didn't really work was because of, there's a lot of post-war housing, especially in uh, this area here. And uh, we the, were using uh, the 18th century to 1927 as uh, the period of significance here. So any, uh, and being when the first mills were developed to when the flood happened. And so a lot of this in, these post-World War II housing uh, here uh, wouldn't have been what is known as a contributing building to the district. And you would have had uh, not a very tight collection of historic buildings. Uh, once you get out past the yellow here, you do have historic buildings, but they're kind of spotty here. So to give the district uh, a much better uh, and tighter uh, feeling, the state decided to reduce the size. And uh, I mean, it, it does make a lot of sense. You do miss out on some individual buildings out this way, but by keeping the district uh, tighter, you also you have a much uh, higher collect a higher density of intact buildings, and not to mention, I mean that's how it was in 1856 as well. So it really does reflect the historic, the historic pattern as well. And once again, another this is an 1869 map. So really, there wasn't much out here except for the school. So you do have everything sort of gravitating towards the river. And a lot of, I was talking about sites and also archaeological value. Uh, there's a lot of mill sites along, along the river. You have a grist mill and a plaster mill. You have a circular sawmill. Uh, you have a blacksmith shop and another a wagon shop all around the, uh, the river there, which are no longer intact, but uh, there could be information in the area. Uh, and this is uh, how the, uh, the district is being presented today. And you'll see a lot of little black and white. Uh, black means it's a non-contributing building and white means a contributing building. And I'll go in more detail about that. And just uh, the same view of the district from, uh, from above. Kind of repetitive in, uh, in the mapping, but it does show you uh, how big an area it is generally follows the property lines. Uh, so it goes to the back of most of the lots on Falls Road. Uh, it gets a little tricky with the park here uh, in terms of determining a boundary. You want to be able to capture where the mill sites were, but not take the whole park, include the whole park. So that was the only area that, w was, uh, that didn't really truly follow the parcels. And what is the, uh, the National Register nomination? It's a big document, and that's where I come in. And uh, you take every building, and you describe the building. And uh, this is why writing a book about snowboarding is kind of exciting, because uh, you, you, you describe buildings uh, after a while. You've got to describe every window and every type of siding. This is for the 
village center that we are in right now. This is the nomination for it, so we can pass it around. Wow. This is not what the new one will look like because everything is digital, but if you want to get a sense of these descriptions that Brian's referring to. So every building is described, and then you do a, uh, a history of the occupants of that, each building and, uh, and try to get a sense of who lived there and what they do and what was their contrib contributions to the community. Uh, did they work in the mill? Did they own the store? Were they a teacher? Uh, were they a farmer? And that helps. So there's section seven, which is the building descriptions, and then there's something called section eight, which is the narrative description, where it, is, uh, it gives you context for, for how these buildings developed and who lived in them, and uh, you, that's more of a general history. And uh, that's the part I love doing. Uh, because you really get down, that's, the, that's where the research is the best. You, get, you find out about these people and, uh, and find, find their stories. And the, that job has gotten a lot easier since perhaps when that one was done, just because of newspapers being digitized and the, the amount of newspapers being digitized. Uh, and when I f did my first nomination, it was looking at microfilm at UVM, and that took forever, and it really was like searching for a needle in a haystack in terms of finding that information, your eyes would glaze over, but now you have things like newspaper.com and you can just search names and dates and they pop up and they highlight it for you and uh, it's amazing. And then here in Shelburne, one of the best town halls, town clerk's offices I've ever seen. I mean, every single deed here is digitized. And so I can, you, you don't have to, I mean, when you usually do a deed research, you pick up one of those big books and read it and find out who bought, sold the building to them, and then you go find that book, and you're just going back and forth, back and forth, these big books, and uh, now you can just do it all online on the computer here. It's uh, absolutely amazing. So that's a credit to Shelburne right there. And then photo documentation of the building itself, and that will comprise a, uh, a National Register nomination. I just... You know, like I said, September 11th is really, what, I mean, September 11th, uh, February 11th will be when we really focus on the history, but uh, uh, the brief history of the, uh, of the area is, uh, you know, the Benning Wentworth uh, distributed uh, grants for a town and so throughout Vermont, and uh, each of those single squares was like an individual uh, lot that was sold to a proprietor to an investor. Uh, those initial proprietors, investors, very rarely came to Vermont. Uh, they were down in Massachusetts or Connecticut, and they were doing what's really the American dream. They were land speculating, and uh, they pretty much flipped those properties even before they set eyes up here. Uh, they had the piece of paper, and they found people who were willing to move up here and uh, settle the land, uh, with one of those people being Ira Allen. And uh, he's, uh, he's up and down the state, because even down in my, uh, my neck of the woods, uh, he owned a lot of property down there and lived down there as well in Sunderland. Uh, but he's, uh, he's, he recognized the value of uh, the La Platte River and bought property around there, established a sawmill and a forge and other uh, industri early industries. And the village grew from that point forward. Uh, with subsequent mills replacing the old ones and uh, other types of industry. Uh, and then farmers would move into the area as well. And uh, you'll see in the Shelburne Falls, the, the, the east end, if I'm doing it right, there's a lot more farmhouses over there because they were sort of on the edge of the industrial area and they had more land while the the houses closer to the falls had less land. And then you go to the west end as well, there was larger land. It's like if I go back to here, uh, W.R. Lawrence, that was originally the Bliss House. I mean, that was, that was all their farm right here. And this was all farm. I don't have it all on the map, but as you get on the edges, there were larger pieces of farmland. And as you get closer to the center, there were smaller lots with more commercial or industrial use. Uh, just this is an 18th century map, uh, 1780s, I believe. And on that map, when you get these statewide maps, uh, you don't get too much detail. You really have to, not until the 1850s do you actually get town maps that 
uh, show like who lived in each house. Uh, but in this early map, it does identify a grist mill, an ironworks, and a sawmill in Shelburne at the Shelburne Falls. And that's a pretty cool detail for a, a map of the entire, uh, entire state. And going back to these maps, I mean, these maps, this is the Beers Atlas from 1869. They are amazing. Just in the sense that whoever, I guess it was Beers, put the uh, maps, uh, did these maps. You know, they had the house, which are fairly accurate in terms of the shape and format of the house, but you had the people who lived there. And uh, as far as research, that is just a, a gift to be able to, instead of starting like whoever going to your house and starting with you and going all the way back, following the, the deeds until you got back to the oldest deed, uh, these maps provide you a sort of like a halfway point back in the 1860s where you can sort of dig into the, uh, the research. So uh, a gift from a, as far as a research, as a research point of view. Uh, as I said, the period of significance is 1785-1927 uh, from uh, when the first bridge crossed La Platte, La Platte and then also the first mill and then ends with the 1927 flood that uh, wiped out. Uh, pretty much the remaining bu mill buildings and which were never rebuilt so it, it ends uh, that 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 sort of defining period in Shelburne Falls' history now having a post the National Register is a rolling number you just have to be 50 years or older to be on the National Register so right now if you live in a 1969 house it can go on the National Register uh, so that is not saying all these other buildings that are in in the Shelburne Falls are not historic, are not eligible for the National Register uh, because uh, you, I mean, this is just all hypothetical, but they, the first sort of thing you have to check off the list, are you 50 years or older? And a lot of those houses in the Shelburne Falls, post-war houses are 50 years or older, but they don't contribute to this sort of cohesive story that we have of, uh, of the industrial commercial history of the of the village, uh, most of those post-war houses reflect more of the suburban era and uh, and not uh, the commercial industrial era. So that that's a big reason why there is that cutoff point. Uh, just uh, some pictures of uh, of the mills and the sawmill. Uh, it and another. Even though the maps are a great resource, uh, finding pictures for this project proved to be very challenging. There were a lot of people did help me in the community, but there wasn't a, a, a huge abundance of them. So uh, I had to use a lot of uh, evidence of reading the deeds, looking at the buildings. You didn't have as much benefit of uh, historic images to, uh, to do the research. Uh, so some of the representative styles that we'll find in the, uh, in the village, uh, early federal style, early Greek revival style, anywhere from uh, 1780s to 1820s, 1830s. Uh, we have the oldest house in the district right there, um, Israel Burritt's house. Uh, there was a, uh, a store in the basement. Uh, this house had a butcher in the basement. And uh, we had, this was a farmhouse, really. Uh, very similar in a sense that they're all eaves front houses, the gables not facing the road. A lot of typical Greek revival houses will have the, the gable facing the road. These are all similar in a sense that the eaves are uh, facing the road and all intact in that regard, too. And more Greek revivals. Now you do have uh, gable facing the street, gable facing the street, so you have both book styles as well. And then Queen Anne, uh, slightly more decorative. You see decorative elements like uh, bay windows, details up in the gable, um, two uh, cross gables, two, two gables meeting each other. We do have a uh, historic picture here, so you do are able to tell the evolution of the house. Uh, not knowing off the top of my head when this picture was taken, but we do can tell that this upper bay window was added at a later date, sometime after this picture. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Whoops. 
Embarrassing. Um, I'll just move on from there. <laughs> and uh, we do have uh, this later sort of uh, uh, sort of subdevelopments too. This was originally farmland, and then a guy by the name of Lee Tracy divided the land up into smaller components. So you have you have sort of the original development of. Uh, these Greek Revival homes, federal-style homes with larger pieces of land, probably some farmland. And then, starting in the 1870s, 1880s, a lot of this farmland was split up into smaller lots. And you'll see these type of houses as well, uh, houses from that period. And then we have sites. Uh, there's not really any foundations uh, down by the river. They're hard to come by. Uh, but you do see evidence of, of the industrial history there. Uh, you know, I, I don't even know how to describe them, but you see pieces of concrete, pieces of metal, piles of stone uh, that help, that sort of point towards a history that was down there and uh, uh, sort of is evidence of the industrial history down there. Outbuildings are also uh, part of the nomination, whether they be uh, farmhouses, hen houses, um, garages, tanneries, lots of different uses, uh, but they are also included in the nomination. And then you have non-contributing buildings. Uh, they are still part of the National Register District, but uh, they uh, are not uh, considered a contributing building. That really doesn't since we've already established the fact that you can do anything to your building, it really doesn't do, it doesn't affect, there's no, just, it's a non-contributing building or contributed building. It doesn't really change what it means to have a house listed on the, in the National Register District. Uh, so sometimes they're non-contributing to the age. Since we have 1927 as a uh, cutoff point, uh, these houses were post-1927. Uh, post moved. Uh, this was uh, certainly a very intact, great historic structure, but it is not in its original site. And that's a, in terms of, of integrity of a building, any building that's been moved, it loses its integrity because it loses, you've lost where it was originally, how it related to other buildings, what was the setting around that house. Uh, so you still have a wonderfully intact great architectural building, but since it's not where it was originally, you've kind of lost that context. Yes? Do you know where that one was originally placed? Uh, I think somewhere by UVM, I believe, right? The hospital. Yeah. The hospital. I think it was the old infirmary. It was the like pest house. house. The pest house. The pest house. What does that mean? It was for quarantine. I think people had a, a pest That's house. So you've lost you've lost its relationship to the other hospital buildings and how it related within the medical theme. Uh, so that is why it is non-contributing, even though it's a great building. Uh, you have alterations over time, and uh, they uh, you've lost what the original building looked like. More alterations. And you yeah, have buildings uh, that maybe haven't uh, gotten as much love and care as other buildings, but they still are, are intact, great uh, buildings that are still considered contributing buildings to, to the district. And you have uh, changes to buildings. Uh, porches are added over the years. Uh, maybe windows are replaced. It. Porches are closed in. Uh, maybe new stairs are added. Um, towers are added sometimes. And so just because the changes have been made to the original house, uh, they were done during, a historic, during the historic period, so they are considered part of the evolution of the house. So it doesn't need to be caught in time. Preservation, the word, suggests the continued use of a building and making sure that that building gets continues to be used. And those changes to that building show that the people who own those houses found ways to continue to live in that building. So they had additions put on or 
of that like. Uh, we're, not in, we're, not we're not dealing with the word restoration, which is picking a period in time and making that building exactly how it was in that period of time. Uh, so changes to a building are, uh, are fine. There have been some changes since 1995, as, or whenever the, I don't know if that's the right time, whenever the grad students were here. But this building was part of the original draft nomination, and that is what we have there now. And uh, even the course of the beginning of my research, uh, when I first came around and did my documentation, that building was there. And then when it came around uh, not too long ago, it was not. Uh, so, uh, you know, things, uh, it's, not, it's always changing. And even though we did end in 1927, that is not saying anything. That's the end of historic significance of uh, Shelburne Falls. We still have a vibrant community here uh, with people living there, with businesses and uh, so just because we say 1927, that does not take away from the fact that this was a, uh, from 1927 to the present, that we have a, uh, a bustling, uh, intact community that uh, continues to today. And I think that ends it. Any questions? Can I just get one um, issue addressed, Brian? Uh, could you talk a little bit about the process for getting a draft nomination reviewed and approved. And the reason I'm asking about that is you had said something about how the state had decided to reduce the size of the district as it had originally been mapped out by the grad students. And I wanted to make sure people understood that it wasn't like the state actually came in and dictated to the town to redraw the boundaries. It's There's a process that involves a draft being prepared by an expert like Brian, and that draft goes up to a state Historic Preservation Advisory Committee, and there's a state historic preservation staff, and my understanding is, is that it was really the feedback of the professionals that, you know, your first draft, you've drawn it too big, so think seriously, and it was really more of that kind of redrawing than the state coming in and doing it for us. Yeah, I mean, I, even as I was saying that on my mouth after I just told you about how the federal government can't do, make you do this, and I was sort of emphasizing that point, and then I said the words that the state said you can't do that. It really isn't that. They just want to really make the best nomination possible in terms of uh, integrity. I use that word over and over, but what really, um, really makes tells the story the best and doesn't has uh, less loose ends. I guess is the best way to put it. Uh, so they. I mean, I do lots of National Register nominations, and uh, I think they're done. And then they go up to the Advisory Council, which is a group of volunteers who review each application or nomination, and then it goes up to the federal government for the final review. But uh, inevitably, there are questions that come up. You know, why didn't you choose this building? Are you sure about the age of that building. Maybe you should mention more about this architect and uh, other items. So it's really just constructive feedback to uh, make sure the best nominations put forward. And I've done, I mean, I did a nomination in White River Junction where it's, uh, you know, there was a core downtown and then there's these building, buildings out on the edges and they were sort of left out. So we expanded the district to include everything that was sort of in the visual downtown that made sense when you were looking around. But the risk that we discussed back and forth with the people in White River Junction, with people at the state, was by adding these buildings on the edge, the benefit is that you do get the entire community, but you're, there's a, you're bringing in a lot of buildings that don't really uh, are, have lost their integrity. So are you running the risk of having a really sort of tight collection of buildings that are intact and really tell the story versus having a larger district with more buildings but you're sort of, it's sort of, sort of fading out in terms of its integrity. So it, it's, a, it's a discussion. So it isn't, I mean, Dean's, Dean's right. It wasn't like they said you're wrong. Uh, but it's really just a process to make sure you can uh, have a, uh, a nomination that tells the best story and uh, has the highest integrity. Um, having said that, you could probably, you could nominate that district as uh, originally uh, 
proposed, but uh, this, this one is a much more coherent uh, nomination in terms of boundaries. Does that take care of that? Sure. that, that question? Any other questions for Ron? Is there, go ahead, Tom. Um, <clears throat> should I speak in the mic? Uh, Tom Tompkins. Um, a number of years ago, there was a town committee that uh, was looking into parts of Shelburne where infill housing could be built. And one of the places they selected was um, the properties that are on the north side of Falls Road because there was, you know, sufficient land in the backyards, they felt, to uh, put in a, a small housing development. Um, the road, one of the access roads to which would have uh, been where one of the historic homes is, that would have had to be torn down. So I guess my question is, uh, if we are on the National Historic Register, does this preclude or at least... Um, give pause to uh, turning the backyards into a housing development? Well, assuming there's federal money involved, it definitely would trigger a, uh, a, a process that's known as the Section 106 process. And that's something I also do uh, throughout the state. And that involves uh, whenever federal money is used, you, you assess the impact of that proposed work on the historic building or the historic district, and you try to find ways. It's a, it's a process in the sense that you go back and forth and you try to figure out the best plan that you can do. And uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't stop it from happening, but hopefully through open communication, you will be able to come to some agreement, maybe some alternatives or what have you. Sometimes when alternatives, when there are no alternatives, and you, you find ways to mitigate. You know, if that building does have to come down, without knowing much about the story, but if a building had to come down, what can we do to make sure we can tell that we haven't lost this building entirely? We can fully document it. We can do drawings. We can put up interpretive signs telling about what was here before this had to be done. Uh, so, but ideally, you don't even get to that point, and let's say, let's look at alternatives. Can we make a driveway somewhere else? Or, can we put this development somewhere else or what have you? So there, it does uh, pause the process and make sure that you're looking at all the alternatives. Uh, Tom Zanotti, um, where do we, well, first of all, are, are you paid for your services? Yes, I am. Oh, you are oh, by, the, by the town? Yes. In a grant. In a grant, yeah. I see. And uh, where do we stand in terms of the continuum of, of ultimately presenting this to the state um, on what, what steps are required before we hit th at that mark? Uh, well, I, uh, we have a draft, and the state will look at the draft, and there'll be some back and forth in that regard, you know, fine-tuning it a little bit, and then it goes to an entity known as the Advisory Council of Historic Preservation, and then there'll be a little... In the state. Yes. And then there'll be a little back and forth on that, and then it would go to the federal government. Uh, Having said that, I, the uh, government shutdown has really put a, uh, a huge pause on, on the process. But it takes a while. And there's a, I just had, I just did one for Gilbert's Hill, which is the first rope tow in Woodstock. And that just got passed by the advisory council today, or this past weekend. And I believe I started that process probably a year, year and a half ago. So it, it's, uh, Takes a while. This is, this is just an aside. Uh, we we just happen to have been uh, very good friends with Russ Gilbert, whose family um, started the, yeah. the the first rope tow. So Great. that just touches. And I've been to the place. It's it's amazing just kind site. Of, it, pretty cool. Yeah, yeah nice. there's a lot of fun doing that one. I'm not saying this one wasn't fun. This one's fun too. But uh, having a, a Model T as a uh, as a rope tow engine and uh, the stories of people having to the rope would just go around a bull wheel and they just grab on like for dear life and get pulled up the hill 
their gloves would be frayed. There's inevitably a story of a scarf getting stuck in the bull wheel and what have you. So uh, it was a <laughs> it's quite an event there. But that is an aside. But that's interesting. I'm Dorothea Pinar. I'm on the Historic Preservation and Design Review Commission, and I just wanted to clarify: um, there is two designations. Uh, the Falls has always been, since the early '90s, in the Design Review District, and some of you have come to us with any exterior changes. Um, and that district is actually includes the buildings that are post-war and along uh, the Falls Road. So. Um, Actually, the National Register is far less restrictive than you're already under, and you've been under that, um, that district for a while. So something like a development, for instance, for infill buildings, would have to go to our commission first for review uh, before it even went to the Development Review Board. So we would take into account the impact uh, uh, on historic buildings, um, visual, the changes of the streetscape, massing, all those kinds of things, like we did with the Harrington Village that was placed in the National Register District Village part. And that's also part of the Design Review District. So, And I just wanted to thank, to Brian, because I used to do this work in the 70s and 80s. I'm a dinosaur. And um, uh, when I read the nomination, because I've been wanting this district on the National Register for years. Dean can always say every year, I bring it up, we need to get that nomination done. Um, I was thrilled when I read uh, Brian's work. It's, it's really interesting, um, not only as a preservationist, but as somebody who's in the Historical Society, of all the extra history that we are learning through this process. And I just want to thank Brian for really his, his wonderful work. And, um, you know, I think making the district smaller is going to uh, make it a better nomination when it gets to the federal level, too. You don't want to be challenged when you've done all this work to get up there and get challenged on your, on your boundaries. So I, I really am thrilled about this district being done. And I think, you know, going back to just the, the, the short, the the minimizing of the district. Those early maps that I showed you, 18, the 1856 map and 1869 map, I mean, that really tells you what was here in the 19th century. And I think that, that having the nomination reflect that, that those map images is uh, pretty powerful in the sense that you have a, a high percentage of those buildings still there. I mean, and you, all those names that are on that map uh, they, they're the ones in the story, and uh, so I think it says a lot to have sort of a nomination that reflects that map. I'm just gonna, I was just going to comment, because I read the uh, initial draft, was that what I'm really impressed with is the amount of ownership change there was through the years. I mean, you think of it as being sort of maybe generations and a lot of times it really wasn't every two or three years maybe a property was changing hands yeah from a from a research point of view you get pretty excited when you see somebody owned a house for like 30 years because <laughs> you kind of take a break from the <laughs> from all the research it gives you sort of a, a little bit of a leeway but it, it is a challenge to do that i mean there's a, there was a lot of of uh property exchange. So it, it is a bit of a sort of map trying to figure out. A lot of subdividing, a lot of lots being uh, subdivided with, with Tom Liz, that was uh, That's confusing right there. There's a, a lot of different lots being split off there and trying to keep track of that was uh, a bit of a challenge. Just one more thing. <laughs> uh, on a practical level, <clears throat> The village has been on the National Register and the Design Review. And um, having Route 7 going right through our village is a challenge, to say the least. Um, because it's on the National Register, we've been able to avoid the four-laner coming through this village and really destroying the quality. Um, I come from Detroit, and I also worked in New Haven, Connecticut. The, you know, epicenter of urban renewal and that sort of thing. And, you know, built, putting up highways through neighborhoods, making it just 
you know, not a community anymore. Really could happen here, but with that National Register and having that review, we have an input to the state, and the state has it to the feds to keep our village and the village character. So that's why I was particularly, uh, when I saw how beautiful the falls was when I moved here, I was impressed by it, you know, not even knowing the history. Um, you wouldn't want, with a, you know, the traffic patterns and stuff, some, somebody justifying a widening of that road and really making your neighborhood unlivable. Mark, you're the only Spoken for all <laughs> pressure. Not to put you on the spot or anything. I'm Sarah Tompkins, and I'm his wife. And I, what he was referring to was that on the front page of the Shelvin News, they had this 20 year plan, and they had a road going right through the houses and had the sidewalk about two feet from our window. And nobody on the street knew anything about it till it was on the front page of the Shelby News. So you can imagine people were pretty upset that nobody bothered to tell them that this wonderful development was going to be, and it was going to go right through an, ant, an old house. And sometimes I feel like that the houses are only there until the town decides that they want to get rid of them. And I think it should be more than that. I think these houses are old, they have character, they have history, and I just, I feel really bad when I see them taking them down. And I would like to see Shelvin be really serious about taking care of these houses and not taking them down and not putting development where they are. Yay! Yeah, and I think you have, uh, you have the perfect entity here with the Historic Preservation Commission. Uh, they, uh, that's, they're, <laughs> with their with their abilities and design review and uh, they can help guide projects through and hopefully are keeping an eye out on the buildings like you said we don't win every battle but we do we do uh, try yeah. but. you know a lot of towns don't have historic preservation commissions and I mean that's one of the best things about this Shelburne is a certified local government, which uh, there's, I don't know how many in the state, but not every town is one. You have to apply to become one. One of the elements being having a design review district and historic, historic preservation commission. But it does give access to funding that are able to bring in people like myself. And uh, uh, it's a great resource and to have uh, an active one that takes advantage of, of the funding and uh, is great. It's a good resource to have. this any longer than it needs to, but I wanted to thank everybody again for coming out tonight. Um, please sign in or provide your contact information if you haven't done that already. I realize a couple of you got in late, so if you uh, could find the sign-in sheet, please do that. Um, Brian mentioned that there is a draft of the document that is in circulation. You can find a link to that on the town's website if you go to the Historic Preservation and Review Commission page on the town website. If you have any problems, just let, let me know. Um, and do please consider attending the meeting on February 11 when you will get even more details about the history of the houses and the people in the Shelburne Falls area. And lastly, tell anybody who you know who might have been wanting to attend this meeting that it was recorded and that it will be something that they can watch on cable TV if they have cable or online if they don't, uh, or even if that's how they prefer. Uh, and if, even if you got here late and you wanted to see what the first part of the presentation was like, tune in. One more thing, if you could just repeat, oh, if you could just repeat what's going to be happening on the 11th and how it differs with tonight. Dorothea, I'm going to let you, since you're involved with the Historical Society, I'll let you. Uh, yes, the Historical Society will have Brian come again on the 11th, uh, 7 o'clock here in room 1 and 2. And um, it's, the focus will be more on the history of the district. Um, tonight's meeting was really for landowners to understand the you know, what the designation really means. But Brian's going to wow us with all his research and, um, and, and you know, talk specifically about the people who live there and, and the kinds of activities and that sort of thing. So we really would love for everyone to come again. And uh, again, we'll have refreshments, probably even better because Dave, uh, David will be cooking. So. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> so yeah, please come. And I'll get my buildings right this time. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you.